Vince Harding, you helped Dr. King write that speech, Beyond Vietnam. You sat there for days preparing this, the famous speech he gave April 4th, 1967, a year to the day before uh, he was assassinated. He gave that speech at Riverside Church. It became known as Beyond Vietnam. Let me play a short clip for you now. We do not stop our war against the people of Vietnam immediately. The world will be left with no other alternative than to see this as some horrible, clumsy, and deadly game we have decided to play. The world now demands a maturity of America that we may not be able to achieve. It demands that we admit that we have been wrong from the beginning of our adventure in Vietnam that we have been detrimental to the life of the Vietnamese people. The situation is one in which we must be ready to turn sharply from our present ways. That famous address Time magazine later called the speech uh, demagogic slander that sounded like a script for Radio Hanoi. The Washington Post declared that King had diminished his usefulness to his cause, his country and his people. Uh, Vince Harding, your reflections on that speech in which he said the country he loved, America, the United States, was the greatest purveyor of violence on earth as he spoke against the war in Vietnam, where we are today with the wars that President Obama is presiding over in Iraq and Afghanistan and Pakistan? Well, I think, Amy, that that speech, which was not simply mine, but which definitely spoke to Martin's own deepest convictions, that speech and the segment that you just read, for instance, is now very clearly the truth of Vietnam, regardless of what Time or The New York Times or The Washington Post was saying in 1967. By this time, we realize that King was the one who saw most clearly and most adequately what it was that was going on in Vietnam, and he called us away from that kind of adventure. He called us to become a mature democratic country and not a country of cowboy teenagers. And this, I think, is still the need for us right now to find a way to become a mature people so that we can recreate the country that is so badly in need of that vision of a more perfect union. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Reverend Jackson, uh, 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 the may, wars, may, may you've mentioned the wars. One, one. I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I, I wanted to say was that one of the fears about interpreting Dr. King as a one with a dove on one ear and a flower on the other is to miss the fact he was a man of courage and conscience and confrontation and then conciliation. Yes. He won yes. the battle yes. of Montgomery, confrontation, the battle of Birmingham, the battle of Selma, the battle of Chicago, the bounty in the war in Vietnam. He must be seen as a fighter who chose tough negotiations uh, and um, and confrontation and then reconciliation. And that was the point that made him are distinctly different, that he took the risk of fighting the battle to, to bring about the victory for reconciliation. But, uh, Reverend Jackson, I'd also ask, uh, like to ask you, because you mentioned the uh, all of the money being spent on the current wars. The United States is involved probably in more wars right now in different parts of or, or military adventures in different parts of the world than at any time in its history. You've—Libya uh, has been in the news a lot. You uh, once met with uh, uh, with uh, Gaddafi. Uh, you're familiar with the situation in Libya. What is your sense of uh, the United States' involvement in uh, efforts at uh, regime change in Libya? Twofold, it seems that, number one, the idea of, of a humanitarian mission there was, was well-founded and probably could have been negotiated to a conclusion. Because, after all, the, the forces, the rebels in, in Libya did not come in Gaddafi as the peaceful demonstrators did in, uh, in Egypt, 
they came firing, he was firing, so it was a kind of civil war, which we maybe could have negotiated to some conclusion. We chose to go from humanitarian relief to a full-scale war, uh, and now we paid over billion dollars for that war, and we'll pay billions more to reconstruct what we've torn, uh, torn up. And while the chaos abounds and destabilization abounds, now the question the same contractors who are rebuilding and getting the oil out of Iraq will be going that next to next to uh, uh, Libya, which makes it kind of cynical. Uh, I hope that early on that this matter can be stopped uh, and that we can a find a coherent foreign policy. And I find right now, from Egypt to uh, Libya to Yemen to Syria to Libya. Our, our foreign policy is not very coherent. Um, I wanted to end with Vincent Harding. Uh, I'm looking at a piece by uh, from the Black Agenda report by Jared Ball, who said, uh, referring to corporate sponsors, of course, there are others like J.P. Morgan, Murdoch's DirecTV, Exxon, Target, Walmart, other bastions of workers' rights and liberty, all have come together to assure that King be forever separated from himself, from his anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist, and anti-patient work for a genuine revolution. Um, can you comment on that, Vince Harding? Oh, I would like to comment on it, my dear, especially to remind us that this country, this democracy that we're trying to create, was sponsored by slaveholders, slave owners, and slave traders. But that does not mean that that was the end of the story, as our great African-American teacher who was one of our major Supreme Court justices reminded us that though the country began in that way, we could go on to create something new. I'm not worried right now about who paid for the memorial. What I want to do and what I want to know is how the memorial and the spirit of King can be remade, can be taken over into our hands and carried on to the point where we can get past the concerns that King had for racism, for materialism, for militarism. Those were his three major concerns as his life ended. If we can take that on at this point in history, then whoever paid for the monument does not matter. We are the ones who will have to create the meaning of king uh, for the future of this country. We want to thank you both for being with us. Vincent Harding, chair of Veterans of Hope Project, longtime friend of Dr. Martin Luther King, author of few books, including Martin Luther King, The Inconvenient Hero, and Reverend Jesse Jackson, joining us from Washington, D.C. The unveiling, the formal unveiling of the statue will be postponed because of Hurricane Irene expected to slam into Washington on Sunday. The dedication will be postponed that President Obama would, was going to be at. But the march— um, for jobs and justice is going to happen on Saturday uh, that will end at the King Memorial. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, the War and Peace.